So welcome. Uh, welcome. My name is Chandra Dasa. I work for the Buddhist Centre Online. Uh, it's very beautiful to see all these faces. I'm never tired of it. I'm never tired of the jeweled beauty of a sort of illuminated screen full of Dharma fairs. Just kind of arise out of nowhere and then vanish back into nowhere afterwards. It's lovely. Uh, I'll, I'll not say too much uh, before we get going. Just a little idea of the order of service, as it were. So we're going to start with an introduction to the evening, really, uh, from Tara Dakini and Vajra Tara from the um, Abhayarana Trust and Subhadra Mati. Uh, it's really wonderful to have the three of them with us this evening. Uh, and then we're going to transfer over to Padmaloka Retreat Centre, where amazingly the community have interrupted, or not interrupted, that's the wrong word, they've incorporated into their ongoing retreat this evening, and this uh, talk by Padma Vajra, which is amazingly generous. Uh, afterwards, we're going to have a response to that talk from Karma Vajra. If you want to wave Karma Vajra in India, so people can see you. Yeah. And then uh, Pad Padma Loka is going to leave us. They're, they're going to go off and continue with their retreat. And we're going to switch over uh, to the London Buddhist Centre with wonderful Yanavacha, who's going to lead us for a half hour or so in some practice in a way, a good space to just absorb what Padma Vajra said. And then we're gonna swing over to Adistana to round off the evening with some ritual and some final words from the Bhairatna Trust at the end. And before uh, we begin all that, I'd just like to thank Bhairatna for this absolutely amazing initiative. Um, so much work has been going on behind the scenes uh, and it's really going to help You'll hear a little more about that in a minute. Yeah, we'll be hearing, as I say, from Tara Dakini and Mahashrata, and we'll keep you updated as the evening goes on in terms of how we're doing with our totals. Um, since they won't be here at the end, just thanks to, to you, Padma Vajra, and to the Padma Loka community uh, for just being willing to, to come here at such short notice and do this, and also to the LBC and Adistana community. This, this degree of coming together internationally it just would not be possible um, without your communities. So thank you very much for that. Uh, essentially, we're here for two reasons. One is to sit in solidarity with our community in India. And the other is to take the rare opportunity to make a quantifiable, very direct difference in someone's life. Uh, I don't know about you, I've got a raft of things that I give relatively small amounts of money to every month. And sometimes it does seem a bit abstract. Like I, I couldn't really tell you what it does. I know it does some good. Uh, today, you know exactly what will happen. Uh, anything you can give will save lives and save livelihoods uh, for a long time, actually. You know, it will give us the capacity to help for a long time. So my message from, from our team is uh, please give whatever you can give give it. I bet you most of us who are here have already given to this appeal. So let's give again. Okay, let's just give again. Make your mental calculation. Uh, what can I give up in order to give more? What can wait this month? Let's just do it. Give that amount. Give a bit more. Just don't hesitate. And if you're in any doubt, we'll provide helpful reminders throughout the evening about how you can do that. I was messaging with Arya Keita yesterday about the orders work in India at the moment, and it seemed to come down to one thing, which is a, a very deep duty of care for each other that's just alive in the order in India. That's what's driving their amazing efforts, uh, which have been undertaken just in hugely difficult conditions through this crisis, perhaps to us unimaginable, unimaginably difficult conditions. That's no surprise. Uh, order members in India make giant efforts all year round just to bring the Dharma to people. Uh, and the loss of any one of our sisters and brothers there is a, is a tragedy. Uh, I don't know about you, but getting the emails every day um, with the names and faces of order members who died, um, I was particularly struck by Achila Chitta and the little detail that you gave Karma Badra that uh, he'd taken early retirement at age 49 and was ready to dedicate the rest of his life to the Dharma. Uh, so, in a way, in that spirit, I think supporting a Bhairatna is a duty of love for us as a community. 
and it's also an investment in the future of the Dharma and of our sisters and brothers who work so incredibly hard to keep it alive. So let's all do our part and make the kind of difference with our wallets that we're fortunate enough to be able to make. And with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Tara Dakini. Thanks. Thanks, Chandradasa, and thank you to you too for bringing this all together in a really short notice. Yeah, so I look after the grants um, for the Bayratna Trust, um, and I'm sitting here in Glasgow. I'm sitting comfortably on my settee, a bit nervous, I must say. Um, I've got a fridge full of food. Um, I've been vaccinated. I feel pretty safe, actually. If I was an order member in India right now, I might well not be feeling so safe. We're hearing all kinds of distressing tales, and you'll know, as just been mentioned, that of the 705 order members in India, we've recently lost eight of them to COVID. And what we're also hearing is that order members uh, throughout India are being really affected by COVID, either directly, or more and more order members are becoming ill with COVID because it's so rampant, especially in Maharashtra. But they're also really supporting their Sangha, supporting their Mitra friends and helping uh, their families, their extended families. Many of them have lost their livelihoods. Uh, some order members live on daily wages, something that we probably can't find easy to get our heads around. And some people lost their livelihoods last year and haven't been able to yet find work again. And they might not be just supporting themselves and one other person, but, but a whole family. Um, so it's, it's really having such a big effect. Um, and what, what, why we come in is that um, the Abhiratna Trust uh, started 15 years ago to give grants to individual order members, wherever they are in the world, who are experiencing, for whatever reason, some degree of financial difficulty or hardship. So we don't give to projects or groups. We just, we just give to individual named order members. And last year we started um, a, a COVID emergency fund to give to people um, around the world in seven different countries who are affected by COVID. And that worked really well. They're fairly modest sized grants, um, under a thousand pounds usually, but it really helps people um, you know, to get themselves going or uh, you know, to, to get, them, get things together for food and bills um, in relatively short time, uh, short term. But this is a whole different, more severe scenario. Um, as I said, more people are becoming unwell. Um, now we will be reading in the news about difficulties with hospitals turning people away, older members uh, maybe not being able to afford uh, to go to a private hospital for food or you know, for, for medicine or even in oxygen in some cases. So um, we've really extended our remit and we're helping people in different ways than we have before. And we also realise that because people's livelihoods are so affected, that this is going to go on probably for the rest of this year. So originally we made a really small appeal to help 66 people, including 15 people in hospital. And within, uh, well, overnight after we launched it on Friday, we'd gone past that total. And um, well, now we, we've, we've uh, raised, I think, 97, 98,000 pounds. This is giving us enormous potential to help people in the, uh, in the order and their friends and their families uh, throughout this year. So we're tremendously grateful already. But the more, the more you can give, the more we can do, basically. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't think I want to say very much more. I know we're going to hear from Karma Vadra later. Um, but uh, if you are able to give today, that's our target, £108,000. I think that's 11 million rupees, approximately. Um, or 125,000 euros or 150,000 US dollars. So that gives you a kind of an idea of, of what we'd be able to do with that money to help individual uh, people, uh, men and women in the order in India. So I'm going to hand over to um, Vajra Tara and Subhadra Mati at Tara Loka. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very, very much, Tara Dalkini. And yeah, we are here at Tara Loka, Vajra Tara and I and our team. And we're actually here to lead uh, two ordination retreats. 20 women are going to get ordained. And being here tonight feels absolutely of a piece with that to us. Um, it doesn't feel in any way separate uh, because we're talking about the order. 
And I arrived first of all, and just as I arrived, the news was coming in of the deaths in India and the tragedy of that was, you know, really nearly overwhelming me. And I was sitting here in the shrine room the other morning, just praying, what can I do? Please let there be something I can do. And then um, I looked at my emails and there was a message from Chandra Dasa saying, do you want to be part of this evening? Um, and I knew without even asking her that Vajratara would be as well. <laughs> and also Dani Uta and Vida Gita are here as well and Sharla. I didn't even have to ask them. I knew they would want to help. So I'm delighted um, Vajratara is going to just talk to us a bit about um, mm. her experience of, of India and the mm. order in India. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I'm not actually from the Abhaya Ratna Trust. Um, I'm from the India Dharma Trust. But I'm uh, very much wholeheartedly supporting the Abhaya Ratna Trust campaign um, at the moment because, um, well, I know the enormous capacity of the order in India and what the order in India can do and their responsiveness to any situation that they find themselves in. And I want to respond to them as they need us now. And I was thinking about my work in India when I'm working with um, what we call the team. They're kind of like the crack team, the A team. And um, some of the things that they, they do. So uh, for example, when they saw that not many people in the slums were join, um, coming into contact with the Dharma and they saw that young men were joining gangs and getting into criminal behavior in the slums, they decided to put on karate classes. And when they saw that um, the more educated people uh, were not coming to the um, classes in certain areas. They just set up a Buddhist center within the center of Nagpur to enable uh, um, those people to come. They've done things like set up retreats for 6,000 people, a kind of retreat, which is a whole festival, a whole kind of village created when they saw that more people wanted to go on retreat than the um, capacity was available at that time. And um, some of you will know that team because they also um, they also uh, uh, put on the order convention in India, which was the last time many of us went to to India. What you may not know was that the time of the order international order convention in India was that um, there were some uh, uh, gangsters trying to take over our land and who were coming to the land every day armed and ready for a fight. And what you may not know was that team was in the background sorting all that out. I actually saw those gangsters arrive on the land and how they responded to them with um, calm, presence, kindness, dignity. And what I realized at that time was, you know, how much difficulty uh, the order in India faces on an everyday level. Um, it's not unusual for order members to go and teach the cl classes in very, very remote areas of India um, after a 28, uh, 24, 48 hour train journey, straight off the train, right into leading a retreat or workshops um, to spread the Dharma. There is nothing they wouldn't do for the Dharma, nothing at all. And what I want to do is respond to them when, as they need it, just to give them their, the conditions they need to get through this crisis so that they can do what they love um, and what they're absolutely prepared to give their all to, which is to spread the, the message of the Buddha and uh, Baba Saheb in India. Thank you, Varachar. When I hear stories like that, and I've heard those stories and many more, and I'm not even a fraction of all the stories, well, I just, I don't know what I am actually. I just know that I, couldn't do that. I haven't got the energy. People think I'm energetic, but I tell you, I haven't got a hundredth of the energy of um, the order members I hear about in India. I haven't got a thousandth of the courage. I haven't got, you know, a thousandth of the dedication. I, I just, you know, I just can't imagine being able to muster all that up. What I can imagine mustering up is 150 pounds. It seems like such a measly amount <laughs> to help to you know, save the lives of these order members who we can't, the world can't afford to lose. Mm. Um, 
it just it feels like it feels like for the sake of that i just want to say like please give 150 pounds please muster that up um if you're rich you know give 10 times that amount mm -hmm. or 100 times that amount but you know it, it just seems like such a small amount i think like every order member is a precious resource every person is a precious resource but i think our order members in india are a resource that I probably can't even, I can't even begin to say because I probably don't even know myself. Um, but, you know, they themselves, as we've heard from Vadratar and we will hear later, they are going out and, you know, saving people's lives by their work, saving their lives by bringing them the Dharma. Each one of them, you know, each one of them who we can help can then go on to help, you know, thousands more people. Um, so, yeah, please do, um, please do give um, the suggested £150 to bring medical supplies and oxygen um, as soon as those order members need it. And as Tara Dakini said, the situation will just go on. So we really need um, as much money as possible. So, um, so uh, yeah, give it now. Um, thank you. And I'll hand back to Chandra Dasso. Thanks very much. Yeah, I mean, the, the urgency couldn't be clearer. So please, throughout the evening, to just um, you know treat it as an open space. You know, it's a bit like wander in and out of the practice that's going on. Give some money. If you get distracted in meditation later, just go and give some money. Come back. It'll be a tremendous help for your concentration. Um, it's my uh, delightful job, just very briefly, to hand over to Padma Vajra and the Padma Loka community. Uh, there's so much I could say about Padma Vajra. He's been a really good friend to me for a long time. He gave me my name, which I'll be eternally grateful for. Um, but the main thing that comes to mind right in this moment is just looking at you, Padma Vajra, with that amazing community around you in that space that so many of us are familiar with. And uh, that's the thing that's on my mind uh, just through our correspondence the last couple of days is how much you can build in community, just like a, a sort of spiritual battery that we can all rely on to be there when we need it. And the ease with which you said yes to this and the speed with which it came together is just a testament to the, the power of community that you've built at Pabaloka. Through all these years, um, I'm just wondering if sometimes I take it for granted. I probably do. So I'm gonna I'm gonna vow try to try not to take it for granted ever again. It's a very beautiful reminder to see on my screen. So I'm going to make everybody else uh, vanish into the background now, and then we're going to switch over to the Tarlok, uh, sit, sorry, to the Pabalok community. And thank you very much, uh, Chandra Dasa, Namo Buddhaya, Jai Bhim. Uh, it's very good to. Um, be with you all uh, this evening. Uh, it's a great honour, actually, to have been asked to, as Chandra Das has said, give a Dharma talk. I was very moved. I, I, I can't really add to what's been said so beautifully by other people about uh, the effect of uh, hearing about the deaths and uh, the terrible plight of uh, Indian order members. So I won't add to that uh, because, yes, Chandra Das asked me to, to give a Dharma talk. and. Uh, uh, he, you might not know, but I actually lived in India. I haven't lived in India for a long time because of my own limitations. Um, but I did live in India for quite a long time and in Maharashtra, especially. And Maharashtra is being hit very, very hard by, by COVID. And there's quite a bit of my heart uh, in Maharashtra. I probably learned more about the Dharma from Indian order members and Mitras and friends than probably anybody else other than Bhante uh, Sangharakshita. And I thought it's very important that we do things properly. So we must start in a proper way uh, by honouring uh, the Buddha, Baba Seb Ambedkar and Bhante. So I'm going to ask uh, David, first of all, to come forward to make offerings to the Buddha and Padmasambhava. And then Vidyadaka to offer to Bodhisattva, Dr. Baba Sevan Bedkar.
and Pragnik Vidaya to offer to an image of our beloved Dante Ogyan Sankarachita. Thank you very much. Those who identify with the battered and the beaten, mark them as saints, for they dwell in the divine. Their heart is soft on the outside and soft on the inside. Say, it's like butter. For they hold the forsaken close to their heart. They treat the enslaved as their own. Tucker says, I won't be tired of repeating, such a person is the divine in person. Uh, that uh, was a free translation of an abanga by Santa Tukoba, Tukaram. Uh, a great bhakti sant, sant of Maharashtra, translated from old Marathi. It's a bit of a free rendering, I have to admit. But um, it came to my mind um, over the last few days. It came to my mind. It came to my mind because of this uh, sense of identifying. His verses, a, a real saint is someone who identifies with the battered, with the beaten with the forsaken, with the outcast, with the downtrodden. And the person who is a real saint, their heart is soft. Their heart is soft on the inside, soft on the outside. Say it's like butter, says Tukaram. And uh, this all was, was coming to my mind in the last few days. And it was coming to my mind because I was asking myself, in meditation, I was asking myself in times of reflection, I was asking myself after hearing from Chandra Dasa, what is really the essence of this life, of this Dhamma life, of this spiritual life? What, what is it that we're really doing? Uh, where, where are we really going? What is the end? What is the middle? What is the beginning? What is this life really about and I think I was being told what it was really about um, from the responses to brothers and sisters in India and knowing how my brothers and sisters in India are the example that they've given me what, what we're really doing beginning middle and end from the beginning of the path to the end of the path what we are aiming to do is to become as responsive as possible. It's all about responsiveness. And there's this very, very beautiful word in Pali and Sanskrit, which used to be used quite a lot in our movement, perhaps not so much. I first heard it from Bhante in seminar uh, when we were studying the Sigalavada Sutta seminar. It's this beautiful word, Anukampa. Anukampa. Anukampa means to shake with, to quake with, to tremble with. That's Dharma life from the beginning into the middle and the end, all the way from now to enlightenment. It's learning to tremble with on ever deeper levels, on ever wider levels, with every single other form of life, every single uh, living being. That is what Dharma life really is, beginning, middle and end. There is no other life. The great master Atisha, uh, who did so much to take the Dhamma to uh, Tibet, was once asked, what is the goal of the spiritual life? What is the goal of the Dharma life? 
what is the, the highest essence, if you like, of the spiritual life. And he said immediately, the goal of the spiritual life is the essence of voidness and compassion. The essence of voidness and compassion. One word, shunyata karuna garba. The essence of voidness and compassion. That's all Dharma practice is for that end. So, uh, Bhante in his seminar on, on this said, well, the essence of emptiness, voidness is compassion. And the essence of compassion is emptiness. This is nothing other than anukampa. This is nothing other than trembling with. Shunyata, emptiness, these, these have nothing to do with metaphysics and complicated mind trips and uh, all sorts of weird philosophies. Nothing to do with that. It's being about, it's all about trembling with, quaking with another. Self is always in relation to other. It's always in relation to other. And unless we're trembling with others, really taking them in, trembling with what's going on for them and responding absolutely accurately to their need, then there is no Dharma life. We're not there yet. We haven't started. It doesn't matter. You could have the most amazing meditations, most amazing kind of philosophical insights, but unless we're identifying with the battered and beaten unless our hearts are soft like butter on the inside and the outside, so that there is nothing between us and others. We haven't started. We haven't even uh, begun. Uh, and it is the start of the enlightenment path and the end of the enlightenment path. It's so very important to, to remember this. And actually you all are, everybody is. I mean, I've been so, um, was almost shocked in the positive sense by, by the incredible responsiveness of the Sangha, the incredible responsiveness to the Sangha, to our brothers and sisters uh, in India. And it's so appropriate. I've been uh, having a lot of memories of my time in Maharashtra, particularly in Bombay. I lived in Pune. Uh, I lived in Bombay and I spent a lot of time in Nagpur. Um, and I know I know some of the more obscure parts of, of Maharashtra. I never went to India as a tourist. I was entirely immersed in, in our Sangha in India when I lived there. Uh, so I know the sugar towns and railway towns of India pretty well as well. Um, I know all those kinds of places. But when I lived in Bombay, I, I, for some reason I've been thinking a lot about my time in Bombay and I've been thinking a lot, a lot of memories about an order member named Bodhi Sen. Bodhi Sen, I don't know if Bodhi Sen's here tonight, but if any friends of Bodhi Sen are here tonight, can you please give him my Jai Bim and tell him that I am remembering him and I honour him and I love him and I'm grateful to him. And what am I grateful to him for? I'm grateful to him because he taught me all about responsiveness. He was the living example of what Vajratara was talking about, you know, those other examples of order members' responsiveness. So I was living in Bombay um, and Bodhisen was one of the happiest people, uh, well, he's one of the happiest people I've ever met in my life. Uh, he lived with his wife and children in one of the jewels. I think he's still there. Um, I don't know if he's still living in these jewels, these, these sort of tenement blocks in, in downtown Bombay. And he would turn up every day where I was staying in the little community that we had. And he'd come to talk to me about the programs that we were going to do that week. Programs being the karakram, uh, the program being the Dharma talk, uh, which we were doing all over Bombay because so many Buddhist localities in Bombay, so many Buddhist areas. And, and he'd come in and tell me all the different places we were going to that week, week, all the different things that he'd set up. And this would involve traveling very, very long distances on uh, Bombay Municipal Ta Transport, the local, as it's called, the Suburban Railway, um, BEST, the, uh, uh, was it Bombay um, Surface Transport, tra Surface Transport, the buses, basically, very, very rough travel. Anyway, 
one day, uh, and then he'd come round when we went to these places and we'd go off to, to teach. It was every night of the week. Uh, anyway, one day I was ill. I'd gone down with some terrible fever, as you do in India, and I, I really felt at death's door. And I thought, well, I can't go to the programme tonight. That's just not possible. And Bodhisen came round and said, uh, come on, it's time to go. I said, Bo Bodhisen, I've got a terribly high fever. I, I'm really ill. It was one of those, you know, where you're really dizzy and you think that you're going to, well, you think you could die any minute. Bodhisattva's face fell with such sadness and dismay. And he said, but Padmavadra, this is a new place. This is the sweeper colony in Bombay Central. This is a new place. We have to go. And I said, but Bodhisattva, I'm dying. I'm, <laughs> I'm really sick. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I really don't think I can go. But Padmavadra, we please, we have to go. Please, please, just come. Just come and sit. <laughs> Just, just come and sit, chant the refugees and breathe it, and then we'll go, just please, you know. And uh, I said, okay, but we're not going by bus. That's fine. We're going by taxi and we're coming back by taxi. We had hardly any money, but I thought, well, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna make it if I go by bus. And um, we went and of course, the, the people had transformed their slum into a paradise. Fairy lights everywhere, a beautiful shrine, uh, incredible hospitality. And uh, we sat down and I said to Bodhisen, I'll say a few words. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Bodhisen was my interpreter as well. And he could make my English into really down to earth Marathi, you know, really communicating to the people exactly as they needed to hear it, making me better. Uh, in, in, my, in my speaking and the thing was I just went on and on and on and on and I know time's passing as, as we speak and I was sort of ecstatic um, and I learned something that evening about responding about responsiveness I learned something about responding to a man who was utterly in love with the Dharma and full of gratitude for the Dharma full of the liberating Dhamma that Dr. Ambedkar and, and Bhante had transmitted him. And all he wanted to do his whole life was dedicated to sharing that as widely as possible. And the whole idea of having, as it were, personal needs, including sort of health needs, was completely absent, you know, completely vanished. I could have done a thing, oh, you know, I'm really damaging myself through doing this, but I didn't damage myself. I got ecstatic. I got, I got completely high giving that talk. I was in another dimension, you know, combination, I guess, of fever, the incredible inspiration of the people and the Dharma itself, the living, uh, the living Dhamma and the feeling of tremendous devotion uh, from the people. So responsiveness, anukampa, learning to tremble with, learning to tremble with uh, one another, starting, yes, with our loved ones and starting very, very strongly with our Sangha, uh, with our spiritual community. Um, I, I live at Pabaloka has an enormous amount of history. You know, we've been here since 1976. That's when it was founded by Sangha Akshita. Uh, we feel this very, very strongly in the community. We, we're very grateful to everybody who's contributed to Padmaloka. We feel a very strong sense of tradition and sort of lineage. You know, we're very, very conscious uh, of that. You know, we, we have, we're not just making it up now. We benefit so much from, you know, the responsiveness of all our brothers before us. And um, part of this history includes what is now our dining room, uh, which is not used, well, it's used for table tennis at the moment. It's not used because nobody's coming and storing uh, some of our stuff. Um, but that, when it was a shrine room, there were very important lectures given in there by Sangharachita. And one lecture that was given there, a very important lecture, which I've been rereading, is a lecture called A Case of Dysentery. 
a case of dysentery. And I was present at that lecture given, I think, in 80 something, I think. It was a, an order weekend. We heard, oh, Banty's going to be giving a talk. Everybody needs to come on this order weekend. And, and he started off making jokes about the title. You know, you know, he thought it was, you know, perhaps he thought it would look good in the in the in the talk catalogue, you know, a case of diarrhea, a case of dysentery, rather than the symbolism of the tantric, this and that. He thought it was a nice down-to-earth sort of title. And we were all laughing, and then it got very serious. It got very serious because he told the story of the Buddha and Ananda at, at Rajgriha or Shravasti, I forget where. Uh, going the rounds of the of the monks, their rooms, and finding a monk fallen in his own excrement, suffering from that terrible disease of dysentery. And the Buddha and Ananda immediately go to help him and they ask him, well, is there no one to, to care for you? Uh, why, why don't the brethren care for you? Why don't the other monks care for you? And he just says, because I am useless to them, Bhagwan because I'm useless to them. So immediately the Buddha and Ananda clean him up, lay him on the bed, make him comfortable, bring him water. And then the Buddha gathers the monks and speaks very, very strongly to them. Well, first ask them, is this true? Uh, you've just left him because you, you feel he's useless. And they all say yes. And then the Buddha gives a very strong communication to them. And I'll mention that. Uh, in a minute what he says to them but I've been thinking about that I've been thinking about that that when Bhante gave that talk he was very concerned about the neglect uh, within the Sangha our Sangha our order at that time the we could be neglectful of one another people didn't look out for each other especially in communities I think especially in men's communities I should say people could be left um, but it's not like that now and this is evidence of that. There's this tremendous responsiveness, tremendous responsiveness to the needs of people uh, within the Sangha far away in India. It's, it's very moving and inspiring to see the change of culture, the maturing within the Sangha, but I'm sure we, we don't always respond as we should, but there is that immediate response. And in this way, we really are following well, our teacher, uh, uh, Bhante, in, in drawing our attention to that uh, text, but also to the Buddha himself and to enlightenment itself. Enlightenment itself. There's a teaching called the Five Paths, uh, which Bhante has sort of um, uh, transformed into our system of practice, the five great stages of the path. And in that uh, particular exposition, the final stage of the path is called the stage of no more learning, the stage of fulfillment, or the stage of spontaneity. Spontaneity. Or spontaneous compassionate action. Spontaneity or spontaneous compassionate uh, action. That's the end of the path. That's enlightenment. And, you know, reading the seminar, Bhante then starts to talk about what that is. Wow, we're going to be told what enlightenment is. Incredible. What is this spontaneity? What is spontaneous compassionate activity? It's simply, you do what needs to be done. You do what needs to be done. For a Buddha, there is nothing between him and what needs to be done. Because there is no ignorance, there is no confusion, there is no attachment, there is no fear, there's no obviously no aversion, there's just a clear sighted situation, a completely clear vision of the other. There is pure anukam anukampa, pure trembling with, pure identification with the other person, and then there is immediate effective action, immediate effective activity, whether it be a Dharma teaching, a clear Dharma teaching, whether it be a meditation instruction, whether it be sitting in silence, whether it be being absorbed in meditation, 
whether it be tending the sickness of a monk who is neglected, whether it be you know, tending to a, a, a mother insane with the loss of her child, whether it be a sweeper, an outcast, cowering against the wall when the Buddha comes into town and immediately sprinkling with him with the ambrosia of his blessing. This is enlightenment. This is what enlightenment really is. This is what liberation really is. We talk a lot about liberation and freedom. It's liberation into love. It's liberation into anukampa. That's real liberation. This is the liberation, the liberty that Dr. Ambedkar talks about, the complete freedom of movement between different communities, uh, between different peoples. And especially we need to exemplify this in the Sangha. And it is so inspiring to, to see that this evening, so moving uh, to be a part of this, to be a part of this, what, what Bhante calls this vital mutual responsiveness. This is the way he defines it's an early definition of going for refuge to the Sangha. We go for refuge from mere social contact to communication, which is a vital mutual responsiveness. Sometimes people puzzle over what the refuge is in the Sangha. What is the Sangha refuge? It's the vital mutual responsiveness. It's anukampa. It's trembling with. It's responding to each other's needs. It's responding to each other's inspirations. It's responding to each other's beauty, spiritual beauty. And yes, it's responding to each other's sickness and dying. Bunty, in his commentary on A Case of Dysentery says some extraordinary things, very, very powerful things. And I, I want to read from him before I, before I close. It is important that as members of the spiritual community, we realize that we have no true refuge except one another. No friends except one another, no real friends except spiritual friends. From the group, we can expect absolutely nothing, nor should we. We belong absolutely to the spiritual community, belong absolutely to one another. We should be prepared therefore to live, to live and to die for one another. Otherwise, we've not really gone for refuge. Our future is one another's future. We are another's future. We have no future apart from one another. The Buddha says, if ye will not take care of each other, who, I, who else I ask will do so? If order members do not love one another, who else will love them? If order members do not inspire one another, who else will inspire them? If order members cannot be happy with one another, who else can they be happy with? If they cannot come together with one another, who else can they come together with? Perhaps we should enjoy one another's company more, appreciate one another more, value one another more. The Buddha certainly valued the monks highly. He says, brethren, he who would wait on me let him wait on the sick, or he who would serve the sick, he who would serve me, let him serve the sick. Bounty again, the Buddha is not being mystical or metaphysical here. He's dealing with the realities of life in the spiritual community. By the sick, he means sick members of the spiritual community. If one wants to wait upon the Buddha, one should wait upon them. Thus, the Buddha, in a sense, equates members of the spiritual community with himself, it would hardly be possible to value them more highly than that. Wow, that's incredible. The Buddha equates the members of the spiritual community with himself. Um, you know, so really serving and tending to one another, we're serving the Buddha. Interestingly enough, this, this, this story of the sick monk, I should just add a bit to it. In the Chinese Buddhist tradition, the story of the, the Buddha tending the sick monk uh, is, is a, a very, very important for the whole inspiration for healthcare among Chinese Buddhists. I was talking to a Chinese Buddhist scholar who's, who showed me a photograph of a huge mural 
of the Buddha and Ananda tending the sick monk in a Buddhist hospital. Uh, and they take it that even just serving anybody who's sick, you're serving the Buddha. Uh, incredible, incredible way of uh, thinking about life, thinking about Anukampa, um, thinking about trembling with one another. Perhaps every center should have a big mural of the Buddha tending, the Buddha and Ananda tending the sick monk to remind us to really care for one another to really care for one another all the time, not just for the special occasions, as it were, but all the time, all the time, in everything that we go through, in all our ups and downs, we need to have that tenderness towards one another, that anukampa, that trembling with, shaking with one another, making our hearts like butter, soft on the outside, soft on the inside. It's interesting, isn't it? The image of the Buddha, the image of the Buddha, uh, he's standing and he's walked, he's walking among the monks. He's standing and kneeling and bending to tend to the sick monk with Ananda, his close friend and companion. In other words, the Buddha is active. He's the active uh, Buddha. We tend to think of the Buddha, always think of the Buddha meditating. He, he, that's, that's the typical image, but my goodness, think the Buddha walked and walked and walked the dust roads of India. He traveled, he went, there's a recurring line in the Pali Canon, which says, I went to them and said, I went to them. I went to those people. Dr. Ambedkar, of course, was very inspired by this and you know, makes it very clear that the, the Buddhists you know, should be very active in communicating their dharma. And they should feel that they're serving mankind through the communication of the, of the dharma. And at our center in Napa in Nagaloka, we've got a huge walking Buddha. This is so, so important that we remember this, that the Buddha is active, active out of this anukampa, this trembling with, this shaking with. And yes, we're manifesting that. We're manifesting that in our Sangha right now in relation to our brothers and sisters in India. The other day here on the retreat, we honored Dr. Ambedkar's birthday, rather modestly compared with India, but we did honor Baba Seb's life. I told stories about Baba Seb's life. And one of the things, of course, that is so important to understand about Dr. Ambedkar is that he believed, he's the most practical man you could imagine, the most extraordinarily practical man you could imagine, hard-headed, a rationalist, um, working in education, trade unionism, politics, you know, to the highest degree, intensely practical. And yet he knew, he knew very, very early on, deep in the heart, deep in the heart, that the only way you could completely transform India, that you could remove the stigma of caste, and untouchability. Yes, you change all the laws, of course you do, but you have to change the heart. And that could only happen through religious change. That could only happen through Dhamma revolution. That could only happen in that way. That's the only way you could get the deep cultural change. That's what the Dhamma revolution is. And that's what our order members and mitras and friends in India are doing in India. They're working for that Dhamma revolution to completely change uh, the culture, a complete change of values and attitudes, uh, underpinning all the social change that is going on. So we really need to support this, really need to support our, our, our Indian Dhamma brothers and sisters because they're bringing the Dhamma back to its homeland. They're bringing the Dhamma back to the land of the Buddha. That's what they're doing. They're bringing the Buddha home, if you like, uh, back to Maharashtra, back to all the states of India, actually. So let's remember the Buddha who walks. And I, I think it's appropriate to end with another poem, a Buddhist poem by a Dalit Buddhist, um, a great Maharashtrian uh, poet, modern poet named Daya Pawar. I don't know the Marathi, unfortunately, and I wouldn't be able to say it, but here's a very beautiful translation of his poem, 
called the Buddha, translated by Elena Zelliot and Jayant Karave. I never see you in Jetta's garden, sitting with your eyes closed, meditating in the lotus position, or in the Ajanta and Elora caves with your stone lips sewn shut, sleeping the last sleep of your life. I only see you walking, talking, breathing gently, healingly on the sorrows of the poor and the weak, going from hut to hut in the life-destroying darkness with a torch in your hand, giving their suffering which drains their blood like a contagious disease, a whole new meaning. Thank you. So Kamravaj is going to respond to Kamravaj's talk on behalf of us all. Yeah. Yes. Just sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Just I would like to thank you, Padmavajra, for a very inspiring talk. Uh, I'll say, Miss, I, I don't have any word to say again from this, uh, my side, actually. It's very inspiring time. I very moved. Uh, from this. So definitely just I would like to express my gratitude uh, for the Chandradasa, Padmavaja and all of you actually. Uh, just first of all, I would like to introduce myself. Just I'm working and my name is Dhamachari Karmavajra. You might heard from last few days by sending the notice from the death of the Indian Order member. So it's very sad for me to just uh, uh, send in this line is notice, but we are, it's just like, I can say I am helpless and unable to, means uh, what you can say. Mm, yeah, we can say helpless, that's the only words, but uh, I'm actually, I'm uh, working as an order convener from last two years, from 2014. And first time I feel that, Means uh, actually up to now I enjoy my work with uh, order um, is with uh, all order in India. We are nearly seven hundred order in India, and I'm working with closely with all of them. So just I don't want to say much, but just I would like to share some few examples. Like yesterday itself, I sent one notice one order member died, and he was just uh, fifty three year old, and. One order member is just like he uh, 15 years, 15 days before he admitted for the COVID, uh, COVID treatment. But now he, he got the brain stroke, and maybe next two days you can get another news that died of the very young order member. So it is the situation in India, it's like that. Even if uh, uh, we have the money, but we cannot do anything like that. But really, I want to appreciate your means, what can say you support for the Indian Order member because you are supporting, uh, you are giving the confidence actually uh, through your money and all these things. So one, one another example just like that uh, I would like to say just from last uh, one, one year from the pandemic start, we are supporting the Order members. So whose wife is uh, means, uh, suffering severe illness from cancer and he's lost his job. So you are supporting like that Order members actually. So that's why means, I would like to say big thank you for you to give me your uh, support mentally and all, all the way you are doing this. So that's why I feel all these things from the Padma Vajra's talk. So it is the things that we are expecting from the Sangha or from Brotherhood. And I am really feeling for uh, feeling all these things uh, from all of you. So once again, I would like to say thank you very much. Uh, to all of you, especially Chandradasa and Padmodra and whatever, all you are av means available for this talk. So I really express my gratitude for all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kamabhadra. Uh, thank you, Padmavadra. Um, maybe just before you go with Padmaloka, uh, 
some some good news and some sad news just even even during the course of this call so um we're now at 103,000 pounds for the evening so only 5,000 pounds away from that initial target and we've hardly got going right so we can easily blow through that easily um but for those of you in the order, you know, we get these emails whenever an order member dies, which is a kind of practice in itself. And just during during Padma Badger's talk, uh, another email came out saying that Prasanna, um, Prasanna Mitra had died today, uh, another order member gone in India. So I don't think anybody actually needs reminding of how crucial this is, but just, you know, uh, use the word there, helpless. Uh, Karma Vajra, it can, it can feel helpless actually when that kind of stuff happens, but of course we're not, we're not, and uh, Padma Vajra's beautiful talk reminded us of just how we're not. So yeah, let's let's carry on through the evening, um, but let's take our leave first of Padmaloka community just with one more thank you. Maybe we can just give a silent round of applause to, to them. Thank you very much. I hope the rest of the tree is as beautiful as the shrine room makes it seem like it must be. So from one lovely space over to another and uh, from one deeply kind man to another. I'm very happy to welcome my friend Yana Bacha. Thank you Chandradasa and thank you Karma Vajra and Padma Vajra. Well, we'll meditate for uh, about 15 or 20 minutes, so not very long. And uh, partly it's a chance to absorb what we've heard from Padma Vajra. And partly it's a chance to send our metta to all those in need. So what we'll do is uh, we'll spend a little bit of time just settling into our bodies and uh, connecting with a sense of open-heartedness. I'm sure all of us have been affected already by this evening uh, and have already been affected by why we've all come together. And then Padma Vajra's talk has um, both moved and inspired us, I'm sure. So let's just sit with an open heart uh, and turn towards your own experience with metta. And then in the second stage, I'll ring a bell. And in the second stage, I'm going to read out the names of those Indian Order members who have died in the last two weeks or so from COVID. There's eight of them that I'll read out. And really, let's just send all our metta to them on their onward journey. Death isn't the end. They will be responding to uh, this evening. They will be responding to our goodwill, our metta, our anakampa. And uh, in a way, uh, the connection doesn't die, even though uh, the physical body does. So let's just connect with them, whether we knew them or not. Let's just hear their names and wish them well, wish them well on their onward journey. And then in the third stage, we'll extend our metta. First of all, to all of those in India who are sick or bereaved or destitute in some way, in need, and then extend that to all beings all over the world. We're all in this uh, crisis together. Uh, some of us are more fortunate in, in this crisis as, uh, as uh, disparities open up. And uh, like um, Tara Dartini was saying, I feel very, very fortunate uh, and, and um, privileged to be living in the United Kingdom. Uh, 
But nevertheless, we are all in the same boat. Existentially, we're all in the same boat. And this pandemic is a worldwide uh, pandemic. Let's just send our goodwill to all beings. Okay, so when you're ready, closing your eyes and... Taking a few deeper breaths. Perhaps as you breathe out, allowing the weight of your body to drop down, drop away. through your seat, through the points of contact with the floor, into the earth. A sense of being grounded. And having a sense of any holding on in the body, any areas of tension, softening. melting away. Noticing how we are in ourselves. softening the heart like butter, soft on the inside and outside. And turning towards your own experience with metta. The Meta Bhavna.
for the names of eight order members who have died from COVID in India. Sending our metta to each and every one. Achala Chitta. Shakya Ditya. Maha Jetta. Nirmala Bodhi. Achala Sia. Hey, Mamati.
Niraj Bodhi. Prasana Mitra. And we've just heard of another order member who is critically ill at the moment. Let's send him all our well-wishing, all our metta, Jnana Gosha. So extending our matter to the whole of the Sangha in India. So many bereaved, so many in fear, in sickness. in poverty. Friends and mitras and order members and their families. And extending more and more to include all beings, all of us and all beings. And if you want to, including not just the living, but also the dead. trembling with all beings.
Coming back to a sense of ourselves and a sense of all of us gathered, virtually gathered from so many parts of the world. good very good to be able to sit with you knowing that meta is a real force it's not just a subjective internal mental state it's a force it's a force of good and uh, the fact that we can as a sangha gather and send meta to those that have died as well as those that are living is something that we need to have real confidence in as a real contribution. It's a real contribution to, to uh, the world. And of course, uh, when we think of money, I think of money in this situation as dana, as metta made manifest, metta made manifest. And I think that, um, well, we've heard of the heroism of order members in India how they work so tirelessly against, against uh, conditions that I can only begin to imagine. We've heard of that. We've heard of the fear and the crisis that they're facing, uh, and uh, not just the order members, but their families uh, that are uh, uh, losing people, um, perhaps losing their employment, uh, uh, it's, it's I, I heard of a family um, on, on, on Monday I, I, uh, where there are five adults in India. And of course, you, you have these extended family groupings living in the same household, which is, of course, <laughs> part of um, the tragedy of that is the virus just spreads to the entire family. <laughs> Excuse me. I heard of this family with um, five adults and two children, and all five adults have died. All five adults have died, and there are these two children left. It's unimaginable uh, what what people are facing. Uh, in a way, it um, doesn't bear thinking about. But I I feel very <coughs> fortunate. Excuse me. I feel very fortunate to be in a position to give and to contribute. I felt so heartened when I received the email from a Bayaratna Trust saying that there was uh, something that we could do uh, because it's so easy uh, to feel powerless, to feel helpless, and uh, in a way to lose the initiative and to get swamped into feeling that there's nothing that we can do, but we can do something. I think that we also need to do something, well, I feel, that I need to do something for myself, which is to give. When, I, when I've given, actually I've, ba- I've gained, I've benefited. So there are people in India who need our money, but I also think that we need to give. We need to give uh, for our, ourselves, for our Dharma lives, uh, and also so that we can feel connected Uh, as a Sangha, so that we don't feel alone in this crisis, so that we know that we're part of a larger community. And because we're Buddhist, I just want to tell you briefly uh, what happened to me when I was ordained. I was ordained in India in 1999. And straight after my ordination, that day after my public ordination, I was um, found myself in the midst of an Indian order convention, 
So 200 order members, it was much smaller at that time, the order in India, 200 order members gathered. And I was meeting them, mostly, most of them for the first time. And at that time, uh, I was working as a fundraiser uh, for the London Buddhist Centre. I mean, actually, I knew nothing about fundraising. And I was rubbish as a fundraiser. But I was trying to raise money for the LBC's retreat centre, Vajrasana. And uh, this Indian order member called Vivek Bhadra, um, we were chatting, we were talking, and he said, what do you do, Nyanavacha? Uh, and, uh, well, I said, oh, I worked for the LBC, and I'm trying to raise money for a retreat centre. And um, we chatted a little bit more, and then he said he wanted to give. He wanted to give to the LBC's retreat centre uh, fundraise, fundraiser. And I was embarrassed, and I said, uh, no, no, that's not why I was telling you. You don't need to give, uh, Viveka Badra. It's just lovely that you want to, but you don't need to give. And he said, no, he wanted to give. And uh, I said, why? Why do you want to give, Viveka Badra? And he said, well, there are three reasons, Nyanavacha. He said, I feel a connection with you, Nyanavacha. I like you. And uh, he'd only just met me. I feel a connection with you, and I want to give to a project that will make me feel connected with you. And then he said, the second reason is that I feel I want a connection with the LBC. I will never go to Vajrasana, the LBC's retreat center, but if I give, it connects me. I will feel connected with your center and with the retreat center. And then he said, thirdly, it's because I'm a Buddhist. That's why I want to give. And for me, that was a, a teaching that I'll never forget. I'll never forget. I'd just been ordained, and this man was exemplifying what it is to be uh, a Buddhist. Uh, it was metta made manifest. And then he said, so he paused and said, let me work out how much I can give. And he said, I can probably, if I save, I can give I can save the equivalent of one pound every month. And I want to do that for a year. I want to give 12 pounds. And uh, uh, I was just, um, I was just, I was so, so moved. I'm so, so privileged to be part of a Sangha where somebody in India wants to give, has given to the London Buddhist Center when we were trying to raise money for hundreds of thousands of pounds of retreat center. And, and now I feel privileged to be able to give back to Indian order members uh, and their families at this time of um, great need, great need. So let's just, I think I need to give. I think I need to keep giving. And I think we all need to give because that is what connects us. That what, that's what keeps our Sangha uh, a Sangha. And uh, uh, well, in, in, as Viveka Badra said, it's for no reason apart from we're Buddhists, and that's what we do. So let's give. Let's give 150 pounds uh, or more. Let's give more if we can uh, to a Bayaratna Trust. Let's give and let's keep giving. And uh, let's keep uh, the metta flowing as well. Thank you. Thank you all. So I'm going to hand back to Chandra Dasa. Thank you so much, Nyanavacha. Very beautifully said. Um, I can attest to this actually. I, uh, I was just going to share the details of how to give again in the chat. You can probably just scroll back and see it. I'd really encourage you to share this appeal with other people, even, even people who are not Buddhists, people who are not Jurat Buddhists. I can tell you this works because I went around to see my landlady last night, who's 83, just to check on her, see if she was doing all right. And um, she said, oh, how are you? And I said, oh, I just had my vaccine. I had my first vaccine shot yesterday and I felt a bit ill afterwards. And I said, it's probably just as well. We've got this event tomorrow, you know, to do with uh, the COVID crisis in India. She listened to a little bit of just me saying what, what was happening in India and she just got her checkbook out and wrote a check. It was amazing. She's got no connection to Buddhism whatsoever, no connection to Triratna. She has a connection to me, but she really responded to the stories of, um, people gathering just to be generous. So, 
please do share it widely. You'll see from um, Taradakini that we've gone through the target. So the target is gone. As Nian about just said, just let's give more. This is a great opportunity. Let's just give more. Yeah. So thank you, Nyana Vacha. Be nice to have uh, the OPC shrine room and the Stana shrine together on screen. Oh, sorry, wrong, wrong one. <laughs> I think I'd never used Zoom before. <laughs> there you are, two lovely shrine rooms, uh, two key spaces for our community. Held so much history and so much love all these years. So we're gonna transfer between them now and move from meditation into ritual. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks, Yanavacha, for the meditation in particular. And I've, I just felt like I really want to keep that meditative mood. So we'll just go into a puja, um, threefold puja. It's going to be very simple. We'll have a mantra. And in a way, um, I think ritual is a, just a really good way to, uh, to, to sit with what we're actually really feeling and then to be able to offer that up um, to the three jewels. Um, in a way that kind of can really do justice to our connections, to our responsiveness, um, to our sense of solidarity with each other. So we'll just move into the threefold puja. I'd like to start with uh, the traditional uh, offerings to the shrine that um, I always enjoy when I've been in India. So I'm going to invite Sangadeva to make the offering to the Buddha. And I'll invite uh, Sadanandi to Garland, Dr. Ambedkar. And Sataloka to Garland, Bante, Ogin Sagarakshita. And we'll make a, a traditional offering of a candle if Sadhananti would make that offering. And an offering of incense of Sadaloka. An offering to our teachers, Buddha, Bhante, Dr. Ambedkar.
and to the three jewels, the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. So I found myself turning towards a poem of Bante's um, since around about November, December, I uh, feel, um, I, yeah, what is compassion? What is compassion? And I think Bante brings out the mystery of that uh, in this poem. So I'll read the poem, The Unseen Flower. Uh, we'll do the threefold puja. We'll have the Shakyamuni mantra uh, after the second verse. Um, and I just invite you to keep our Indian brothers and sisters and the Sangha there in your hearts and minds. Uh, as we chant these words that, or recite these words that are so familiar to us, uh, see if you can really feel them fully in your heart, feel what the words really mean as we um, make uh, our kind of offerings to the three jewels. Okay, just settling into your posture, and I'll read The Unseen Flower. Compassion is more than emotion. It is something that springs up in the emptiness, which is when you yourself are not there, so that you do not know anything about it. Nobody, in fact, knows anything about it. If they knew, it would not be compassion. But they can only smell the scent of the unseen flower that blooms in the heart of the void. Threefold Puja, opening reverence. We reverence the Buddha. We reverence the Buddha. The perfectly enlightened one. The perfectly enlightened one. The shower of the way. The shower of the way. We reverence the Dharma. We reverence the Dharma. The teaching of the Buddha. The teaching of the Buddha. Which leads from darkness to light. Which leads from darkness to light. We reverence the Sangha. We reverence the Sangha. The fellowship of the Buddha's disciples. The fellowship of the Buddha's disciples. That inspires and guides. That inspires and guides. Reverence to the three jewels. We reverence the Buddha. We reverence the Buddha and aspire to follow him. And aspire to follow him. The Buddha was born. The Buddha was born. As we are born. As we are born. What the Buddha overcame. What the Buddha overcame. We too can overcome. We too can overcome. What the Buddha attained. What the Buddha attained. We too can attain. We too can attain. We reverence the Dharma. We reverence the Dharma and aspire to follow it. And aspire to follow it with body, speech, and mind. With body, speech, and mind until the end. Until the end. The truth in all its aspects. The truth in all its aspects. The path in all its stages. The path in all its stages. We aspire to study. We aspire to study, practice, practice, realize, realize. We reverence the Sangha. We reverence the Sangha and aspire to follow it. And aspire to follow it. The fellowship of those. The fellowship of those who tread the way. Who tread the way as one by one. As one by one. We make our own commitment. We make our own commitment. An ever widening circle. An ever widening circle. The Sangha grows. The Sangha grows. Muni, Muni, Maha Muni, Shakya Muni, Sadhu. Muni, Muni, Maha Muni, Shakya Muni, Sadhu. 
Offerings to the Buddha. Reverencing the Buddha. Reverencing the Buddha. We offer flowers. We offer flowers. Flowers that today. Flowers that today. Are fresh and sweetly blooming. Are fresh and sweetly blooming. Flowers that tomorrow. Flowers that tomorrow. Are faded and fallen. Are faded and fallen. Our bodies too. Our bodies too. Like flowers. Like flowers will pass away. Will pass away. Reverencing the Buddha. Reverencing the Buddha. We offer candles. We offer candles. To him who is the light. To him who is the light. We offer light. We offer light. From his greater lamp. From his greater lamp. A lesser lamp. A lesser lamp. We light within us. We light within us. The lamp of Bodhi. The lamp of Bodhi shining within our hearts. Shining within our hearts. Reverencing the Buddha. Reverencing the Buddha. We offer incense. We offer incense. Incense whose fragrance. Incense whose fragrance pervades the air. Pervades the air. The fragrance of the perfect life. The fragrance of the perfect life. Sweeter than incense. Sweeter than incense. Spreads in all directions. Spreads in all directions. Throughout the world. Throughout the world. I invite you to join us in chanting the Dhammapang Galata, the verses that protect the truth, uh, protect the Dharma, and protect, hopefully, our friends in India. Sava papasa akaranam kusalasa upasampada sachitada parudanam etam buddhana sasana Dhamam chare su charitam Natam du charitam chare Dhamma chari sukam seti Asmim loke paramicha Natavata damataro Yavata Sati Yacharapam Pisudvanam Dhamam Kayena Pasati Save Dhamadaro Hotio Dhamam Napamajati Nati Me Saranananya Buddha me saranam veram etena sacha vachena hotu me jaya mangalam nati me saranam anyam tamo me saranam veram etena sacha vachena Nati me saranam sanho me saranam veram etena sacha vachena o tu me namo buddhaya namo dhammaya namo Sankaya Sadhu Sadhu Sadhu
thank you all. Uh, it's really lovely to um, be with you all. We're here, it's our community night tonight, so uh, it's very fortunate for all of us and I don't think uh, we'd rather be anywhere else than with you all here this evening. Um, I found myself on Sunday hearing of the deaths of our uh, Order Brothers over the last week, just really agitated, a, li a little bit like Yanavacha was saying. Um, as I sat with, with that agitation more in the Bodhicitta practice with the Order on Sunday, I, I realized it was just because I, I couldn't control the situation and I couldn't prevent, um, uh, you know, sickness and, and death. You know, that is what the Buddha teaches us. Um, that these are part of life uh, and yet somehow um, I can't just sit back and accept those as facts of life. Um, I, I do have a response. I think we all have a response. Uh, Pamavadra's talk, I think, just uh, asking us to really feel and embody that responsiveness, um, I think is is what the Buddhist life is all about. I think that's what Padmavajra was saying, but it's what the Buddhist life is all about. It's about our interconnection with each other. And um, I think the great solidarity we find with each other, I think when we share uh, going for refuge, when we share the three jewels, when we share Tree Ratna together. So how could we not respond um, to the crisis with our Indian brothers and sisters at the moment. Uh, it's just so heartening, so heartening that um, the target keeps getting reset because of our incredible responsiveness and generosity. Um, even just tonight, uh, we've raised, I think, uh, enough to support maybe over 150 more order members who may be in need and let's just keep giving let's just keep giving because the crisis is not uh, going to go away fast i think it's been an incredible time um, the pandemic for for all of us but in times of crisis i think what it can draw on and what it challenges us to do is to find deeper resources of care uh, deeper resources of connection and deeper resources of um, going, really going beyond ourselves. So I'd like to echo what Chandradasa said at the beginning, um, maybe you've given already, maybe you could give more. Uh, I, I know that there's a sweet spot for myself. Um, you know, I think, okay, I could give that, maybe I could just give a little bit more, but I can give more, I, I, I can give more um, because my Indian brothers and sisters um, have given so much uh, to me and I think so much to, to all of us. For anybody who's been to India and you've been on the end of the wonderful hospitality, generosity, kindness um, of, of our Indian brothers and sisters, it's, it's, um, it's really humbling, as Subhadramati said, uh, what our brothers and sisters give in teaching and sharing the Dharma and supporting each other, it's humbling. Uh, we have so much here uh, in, in the West in terms of our lifestyles and somebody like me who's on support and has been for a long time, I, I can give. Um, any, any little bit I can give makes a difference. So here we are tonight, let's keep sharing this um, appeal with others. I think that's one way we can help if, we, if we've given and we can't give more. Maybe you could encourage a friend to give more. Um, and I was just remembering just one last memory in the meditation as Yanavacha was, um, you know, kind of, I was, I was just thinking about what I've been given by Indian order members on last time I was in India, I only took one bra for some reason, that's all I packed. Um, and I was there for over, over a month with one bra stuck at a retreat center and no chance to get to a shop. Or, you know, because we were setting up a convention, it was all really, really busy. The next thing we knew, we had 100 people coming. The next thing we knew, we had 350 people coming. So we're finding them beds. Um, and after, you know, maybe a week or so of, you know, washing my bra out every night and hoping it would dry in the morning, uh, my, if I told my friend, 
And um, she said, oh, here, have mine. <laughs> you know, I, I can't imagine myself saying the same um, to, to um, someone else. Maybe now I shall, but um, just incredible. Just literally the clothes off one's back uh, and the many, many gifts I've received that I think are just personal gifts from, from many Indian Order members is... Uh, just makes me want to respond double, double, triple fold. So thanks for joining us here at Adistana. It's been a privilege to be able to share with you all this evening. And I'll hand back to, or well, maybe I'll hand straight to Maha Shraddha. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, the first thing I want to, do, I'm just going to say a few words to wrap up the evening. But first of all, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody who's been involved in in organizing this evening. It's been a wonderful collage of, of, of facts and figures and, 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 and spiritual depth and puja, meditation and so on. It's been a wonderful evening and um, the Sangha at its best, maybe, the Dharma flowing through individuals to create a collective which is much, much more powerful than the, than the individual. So thank you to everybody. Um, and thank you to everybody who's given to the Abhirat Trust Appeal so far. Um, and uh, yeah, just keep giving. Uh, so my name is Maha Shraddha and I work for the Abhirat Trust as its director. And it's an honor to serve the order, well actually, and Tri Ratma, through my role at the Abhirat Trust. Um, and it's an honor to be working with such a, a committed and competent team of Jinnavangsa, Taradakni, Akpalavadri and Sila Jala. And together we, I think we, we work really harmoniously well together and we, we want to serve, our passion is to serve the order through the Abhirat Trust. And also we're supported by a very competent bunch of trustees. Um, I think we're not just responding to individuals. Of course, we are responding to individuals in India. I think we're also responding in this appeal to the vision of the Dharma set out by Pam Raj at the beginning that we can all we can all shake with Anna Kampa in solidarity with everybody else. And that, and through that solidarity with other beings, we can, out comes generosity. We respond to others through generosity. We respond to Dukkha. So I just want to uh, say a couple of things um, before I close. One of the, one, one of the practices, uh, one of the many practices, several practices which I do as an order member, um, the, one of the most powerful is the Brahma Vihara's meditation practice. Uh, it's a set of practices that I think we most we all know. And it, two of those are the Metta Bhavna and the Karana, Karana Bhavna. And Karana um, translates as compassion. So in this practice, we connect with the universal truth of suffering and generate or allow to arise compassion in response to that that connection with Dukkha. And it's a compassion that goes beyond likes and dislikes. It's a compassion that goes beyond the confines of space and time even. It's a compassion that connects with, vibrates with, resonates with the deep fundamental humanity of another, of another being. And the fundamental part of that vibration is a natural urge to not want another to suffer. So whenever and wherever we encounter suffering, uh, if karana is, is present in our experience, we want to do what we can to alleviate suffering. So India may seem a very, very long way away in terms of kilometers for many of us, but we can still express karana. We can still um, vibrate in, in sympathy, in empathy with our Indian brothers and sisters through Anakampa, despite the geographical separation. So, so I'd encourage you to sit in meditation tomorrow morning, do or this evening, and in, in meditation, if you're doing the Metta Bhavana or the Karana Bhavana, just see if you can sit and 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 allow Anakampa to to flow through you, allow this trembling, this sympathetic trembling with others um, arise. And through that, uh, see what happens. You might 
uh, end up giving more to, to this appeal from, from that Anacampa. And what I find wonderful about Karana is that it, you can respond to people even though you don't know them. You don't have to know people to respond to them with very powerful Karana. You, by giving to this appeal, you will probably um, positively impact the lives of people who you will never meet. How wonderful is that? That we can have this wonderful impact on the universe. And the other thing I want to say is the crisis in India has brought to mind my dad's death, who died of COVID in January this year. And considering the circumstances, he had a very he had a very good death. In his last days, he was completely dependent upon oxygen, on an external supply of oxygen. In fact, he 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 was being supplied with 15 litres of oxygen per minute. 15 litres of oxygen per minute. He'd become so dependent upon oxygen. Um, but I, I was reflecting um, once I, I learned this, this the, the crisis in COVID. What would it, in India, what would it have been like for my dad to have died without oxygen? One word, traumatic. It would have been traumatic for him it would have been traumatic for us as a family for him to have died uh, gasping for oxygen. I don't want any brother or sister in, in India to be short of oxygen. Having, having been on the COVID ward in the UK, which is, uh, I should imagine, quite privileged compared to, to India, I do not want people to, to, to die because of a shortage of oxygen. Our breath, as we know, is very dear to us. We just have to stop breathing for a while and, and quite soon emotions of panic can arise quite quickly. So let's do what we can to, 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 to prevent that from happening in India. With your help, we can, we can ens ensure that people are not short of oxygen in, in the order, or order members who need who oxygen are not short of it. So please do give and we will do the rest. We'll make sure that your donation makes a difference. It might be to provide nourishing food to an order member and his or her family. It might be to provide payments for rent to prevent the anxiety of homelessness from being uh, an experience. It might be to provide oxygen. It might be to provide medicine. It might be to pay, to pay for hospital fees because there is no room in, in, in a government hospital for, for a desperately sick person and so on. Your donation will make a difference. Um, and we plan to keep you posted of what difference your donations are making by, by posting weekly videos from India on our website www.abiorantrust.org um, for you to keep posted with, with, with what's going on in India. So that's all I wanted to say to conclude the evening. But again, I'd just like to say thank you very much indeed to everybody who's given and thank you very much indeed to everybody who's been involved in this evening. And I urge you to sit in meditation either this evening or tomorrow morning do the metabhavna and, and really um, shake with anacampa and, and as a result, give. In fact, why not have a week of doing the metabhavna and shaking with anacampa and giving? You can, you can give so much every day after a meditation. How about that? Think about it. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Chandra Dasa now to, to complete the evening. Thanks, Maheshwata. And yeah, please do, please do really share this. This is just the beginning, right? That this chance for us to add another layer of depth to our connection as a community. Really bring to life, what was it that Padmavadra said? Liberation into love. Isn't that beautiful? Liberation into love. That's about it. So yeah, share it, share share this appeal, but also just share 
I suppose your, your experience of why it matters with your friends and family, let people surprise you, let people give. And yeah, let's, let's build a community as a response to all of this. So I'd like to thank, uh, in no particular order, Karma Vajra for staying up so very late. It's so late. And there he is, just bright, shining example for us all. Thank you for coming and uh, helping us respond in the West to the crisis in India. Thanks to the amazing team um, at Bayaratna, only some of whom are here. They're just working tirelessly in the background. Thanks to Spadramati and Vashritara for just jumping, well, not jumping out of the ordination retreat preps, because as they said, this is, this is that work. So just amazing that they, they were so willing to come and interrupt that process. And thanks to the uh, amazing community at Adistana and uh, at Padmaloka too. Let's just conjure up that fine group of men, like a, a, a sort of uh, an aurora around Padmavada at the start of his talk. So yeah, maybe you could all actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch to gallery view. Maybe an appropriate way would be to just, you know, whether you want to leave silently and mindfully, or whether you want to just unmute yourself and say your goodbyes before we all disappear like bubbles into the stream. Thank you to Nyana Varch and the LBC as well, and to you, Chandra Dessa, and everyone at the Buddhist Centre Online. Thank you to everyone. Yes, thank you, uh, Tara Darkini and Mahashwada, and well, everybody at Abhiratna Trust and Chandra Dasa for hosting this so beautifully. Thank you very much, Chandra Dasa, and all of you. It's very nice privilege to, to be here in this room. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Chandra Dasa. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nana Watch. Bye. bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, bye. bye everybody. Good night. Bye. 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 Okay, good night. Bye. Okay, too. Good night. Bye. Okay, too. Thank you. Thank you, Avaratna Trust. <laughs>